Yes, she can speak. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's you all stand this morning look to the Lord. Any prayer requests, we would look to the Lord. There's a request for our Brother Francis. He's fighting with pneumonia and my uh, uh, nerve disease there concerning. I can't really spell too much, but... Uh, we, uh, my, okay. And your nephew as well, yes. Unspoken. Unspoken requests, okay. As well, yes. All right, let's all bow our head, Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee this morning. We thank You, Lord, that we can come before Thee in prayer. Lord, You've seen the requests, Lord, that's come before Thee this morning. Lord, whether they're spoken or unspoken, but Lord, it makes no difference to Thee. You can, Lord, meet the needs, Lord, of each one. And I pray, Lord, that You would meet it as we would ask, Lord, as a body this morning, Lord. And Lord, as we've come here to praise Thee and worship Thee, have your way in this service. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. I'm going to have Brother Paul come lead us in the song service. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone this morning. You'll notice I'm not playing guitar because I fell off a stepladder. And uh, I don't roll quite as good as I used to roll. It's more like cartwheel now. Anyway, it's all good. No. By all means. 210 in the red book. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord.
Which one? 209 in the red book. Um. Oh, okay. Onward, Christian soldier, marching as to
388 in the blue book? 388 in the blue book? 388 in the blue book. Yeah. We are standing on holy ground oh, that there are angels all around presence on holy ground we are standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around Four fifty. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within.
Anybody got anything on their hearts this morning? One seventy three in the red. Pretty high. No. I don't know this.
song this morning. Praise the Lord.
guilty to forgiven hungry to satisfied empty to fall and all those lies are shattered and we believe we matter when you change broken into tell us we can never measure up and yet you repeat with mercy and in your eyes we are worthy till at last we can see how much we're loved cause you change worthless into precious Brenda, do you have a song this morning? How much sand is on the shores? He sees every sparrow, the 
Let's all stand with the Lord for a moment. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this morning, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come before thee. We thank you, Lord, for thy spirit. You're able to minister, Lord, to each one, Lord, that has need. But, Lord, at this time we come looking to thy word, Lord, that you would have your way in this vessel, with this vessel of clay as you would see fit. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. As we can see on the screen, I just want to touch just a little recap. Because the subject from Daniel, vision of the four beasts, till you reach the hour that we live in, you could be a month or two months preaching on these things. And the details that's involved, a prophet and apostle have touched most of those things, but I just want to recap a little thing leading up to this hour. It's wonderful to know what God done in the past or down through history. And they're good to know because it's part of the word of God that we carry. But we're here at the end time. And here at the end time, there's things that I want to, Lord permit, if time permit, that I want to touch as we get into the subject of where we are at in this time, what is going on at this period of time, why is it this way? But just to begin with, the things that we, the reason we go back to Daniel, because Daniel seen four beasts that would rise up, he's seen this in a vision, that would portray time right to the very end. We don't have to be concerned with those three preceding beasts, but yet they still have a part to play as we would look at this a little bit this morning. As Daniel seen these four empires, the physical empires, the last, the, all four of them, the three of them had passed by by the time Jesus came on the scene. The last empire was on the scene. It was political. People could see it in history. It's historical, the Roman Empire. And as the Roman Empire, all these beasts were, if you want to, manipulated by the dragon, which is Satan. He uses different empires down through till the time we come to the fourth one. And I know some are young and are new. It's the first time you're hearing some of these things. But just as a brief little touch on, on the time frame. The thing to remember, when the last one came on the scene, which is the Roman Empire, started maybe around some, I'm not going to argue with the dates, maybe around 62 or B.C. And it went to about 490 A.D. later. When it came on the scene, the thing to note that's in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel, the Spirit of God identifies this this way. He says that last beast would be diverse or different than all the preceding beasts before it. Not different in how its political or economic structures were handled. That's not what it's implying to. The last beast would be political. You would see it on the history line. Rome. The Roman Empire. But when it fell, 
Satan played a trick. It went from being a physical empire with an emperor, then on into with the Pope or Christianity was going to take over. So it, that's why it was diverse. It was first political like all the empires before it, but now it's gone into a religious empire. One of the key notes to uh, down in history, when that Roman Empire was about f- starting to fall in the 400 A.D. after Christ, you had the, as it is depicted in, in the scriptures, concerning the different empires and the generals that ruled, that what came into prominence for for a period of time. But when it came to around 470 or 400 B.C., things was going to change, and Satan knew that these things was going to come about, and so. It's not so much said in history, but how many remember or heard the history of Attila the Hun? He conquered a good part of the Middle East, the Asia and the Middle East, and he was coming up towards Italy. He was going to plunder and take Italy too. Now the papacy at that hour had very little power whatsoever. They were just Christians. They were, yes, they were jockeying for who would be the chief pope or the the papa if you want to. But one key event that turned it around was Leo the Great. He was inspired to go up to meet Attila the Hun which was in the northern part of Italy in the Alps. And he was ready and Attila was ready to come down and sack all of Rome, all of Italy. He went up there without an army He went barefoot in the snow before Attila the Hun, and he spoke to him. And for some crazy reason, Attila the Hun believed him. He wouldn't go down and destroy Rome and Italy. From that point on, then the office of the papacy really shot right up. He became, over in time now, became like the emperor of all of that Roman Empire. And the papacy, we know that it rose, especially was really predominant during the Dark Ages. Till such a time, God was going to make, allow another change to take place. As Rome ruled the world, from the time of Christ, politically, but religiously after that, till about the time you hit Luther. God was going to strike that papal head. That's that head that was wounded. It's not a man somewhere that got wounded. It's the office that got wounded. But when they got wounded, it's about the same time God had allowed the Renaissance Renaissance that came on the scene. You had uh, all those reformers starting to come on the scene. So things were about to change. So Satan is not a dummy. He knew something had to change. So the dragon that had been with the all those empires physically, and now he had been with Rome. Now he's looking at America because that's where he's going to go. And so in time, Satan knew that he couldn't stop what God had started in the Protestant protesting the Catholic Church. And there's a whole lot of history. We can go to, like I said, we could spend months just on the details, but we, we're not looking at detail this morning. We're looking for what's happening here at the end. I'm just using that as a little base going along. And so as America gets discovered, that's that lamb beast that you see in Revelation chapter 13 that had two horns. It spoke like a lamb, but speaking as a dragon. Today it's speaking like a dragon. And so Satan would infiltrate himself into that lamb beast, which is America, over here, and it would last long enough till that fourth beast can be established again in its territorial position. And sometimes we ask, well, when is the George Washington vision is going to happen? Not before that beast gets established. 
And we're going to look at that as time will go on in, in a moment. But now we are living that he's speaking as a dragon and it's about ready to go back to these Satan, that dragon wants to go back and control the revised Roman Empire of the one that he had fun with during the Dark Ages and in the time of Rome. So as we are in a transitional period of time, that fourth beast, I'm going to put the glass here now. When we talk about the beast, that's in Revelation chapter 17. It had ten horns then, ten crowns on those horns. Those are the ten ethnic nations that's going to form the head which, of the beast, which is Europe. Well, you say there's more than ten kings or prime ministers in there now. It's pointing to the day that John saw it in 96 AD. There was ten ethnic Yes, they subdivided later on in time. But it's pointing to what he saw in that hour. It doesn't change the territory, although they, Spain and Portugal has divided and other countries, little countries, has split it off from that. So that's the head of the ten horns. The body of the beast is made up of the three empires preceding it. The three empires preceding all had to do with the Middle East countries, Babylon, Media Persian, and the Greek, Greek, and Greek Empire. What they all have common, when John, you see it in the book of Revelation, they're all common to the border of the Mediterranean Sea. What we see now, we've seen since the 19... Well, here, I can put another... God has reestablished, is reestablishing the head under one, under certain events over a space of time, and he's also dealing with the body of the beast over a space of time. And we're going to see that. Oh. Right here. In, from the, after World War II, it took from World War II to about the mid-80s and mid-90s. The European countries were always fighting at one another. But after World War II, condition arose that in the mentality of the people says we must get together somehow and stop our infighting because we don't go nowhere. And so after being Europe being if you want to, in turmoil after World War II, as America would help, the land beast would help Europe trying to come together with, first of all, with money and so forth to establish her. Then in time, those countries are getting together that form what we call in, you see today, the EU. But that's only the head of the beast. So it took time for that head of the beast from 1945 to, I'd say, 19, well, let's say even 1990s. It progresses over time. So the head was in progress of being formed. It didn't happen overnight. The body of the beast is also in turmoil. It started, it didn't start in 1945. It started in 2010 when you had that Arab Spring. Because what caused Europe, the head of the beast, to come together because there was a change in the mentality of the people wanting to do this. They wanted change. While also the body of the beast, when that man sacrificed himself in burning in effigy because of, of the desperate lives that he had, he wanted change. And that set a fire and a, and a movement into the people we want change. And so therefore you had revolutions that, are t that were took place that swept all these countries which is part of the body of the beast. It's in transition. But it ain't going to be in transition forever. It seems the last bastions that are to be dealt with is 
Syria and probably Greece. But when in the underground current of the people wanting change, this is all building up. Yes, you have wars and it seems like things going to pieces. Just like the bride, just like in the days after Brother Branham, this is all seems to go to pieces. But I'm here to tell you this morning, it's going to pieces for a purpose because God's allowing it. All right. So as we move from that, now the motion is in, in play for that body of the beast to be dealt with. Because if the people are not thinking of the terms in order to get together, just another war ain't going to do it. And so the, the ground, the underground, the current of, uh, that is affecting the people will be in place when the time comes. Now, last week we talked about how God works in threes. All right? We've seen how that would be three watches to prepare the bride for her completion, right? And as the bride going through the different phases of those different watches, what will bring her to her completion? It's going to be a war. Well, I don't like a war. Neither do I. Who's doing is it? God. I was reading Oh, it's probably over here. As Brother Jackson was dealing with the seals in 2004, near the end of his life, he was asking the congregation, what's a tear? It's a make-believer. Someone is able to sit in the congregation with the true saints and do as they please until the time comes for separation, and this is the Lord's doing, he said. Well, he's, he's allowing them to sit there. He's allowing them to sit there for a while. But then there's going to come a time he's going to deal with it. The Lord is, it's the Lord's doing. No man can do it. God uses anointed ministry to preach the word and that deal with circumstances that arise. And he, God himself, he's the only one that knows what's in the true heart of the individual. And that's why that's what's been taking place in the three watches to begin with. It's God's doing. God could have stopped things right from the days from Brother Branham, and everybody would have been flown into unity. And that brings to mind the same thing, too. Every time in these, what we're looking at, these three watches, and in the days of Brother Branham, when he goes off the scene, what happened? You had chaos. In the first, what, the, the, no sooner he dies, within the next few years or four or five years, you had chaos in the brand of moment. God's not the originator of it, but he's allowing it to fan and do a separation. And if we're honest to admit what's taking place now, when Brother Jackson went off the scene, chaos struck again. Don't tell me everybody's in unity. Yes, in the Branham camp, there's more division than there is in the, under the message of Brother Jackson. They had more time to play with, to have division. More time to have chaos. But there's chaos here too. From the Philippines, from Europe, from America, and even in Canada. They're all in. Well, we all believe the message. We're all, we're, all going, we're all part of the bride. God's allowing this to do a separation again. And how does he settle things? By having leadership that has a word for the bride, for the hour, and takes place. But we're looking at perfection itself, completion. For the bride to be made perfect. 
It's going to take that miracle war. If there's been chaos, chaos after Brother Jackson, what's going to set it straight? It's going to be a war, a miraculous war for it. Along with that, because this is all going to transpire now about the same time. As the bride is going to be made, come to her final conclusion by a miraculous war, a, if you want to, a, the heir of the miraculous in it, so is Israel will come to her final position in the land with a miracle war. And the beast will come to her final position when you have the Ezekiel war. Because after the Ezekiel war, the body of that beast that seems to be all in chaos and disorder, it'll be, it'll be brought to such a place it will want to join with the head of Europe. So when you stand at the beginning of the week of Daniel, there's three things that predominantly that takes place. The, mir- the heir of the mir- miraculous puts the bride into perfection. The miracle war puts Israel into her finished work. And the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 puts the beast in her final position. Okay. You see what I'm saying this morning? Could I have someone to maybe get a glass of water? Thank you. Getting dry a bit. So, as we are moving in time, we are getting very close to this miraculous war. More and more you see the leadership in Israel. We're not going to let Jerusalem go. It's our capital for eternity. We will never let it go. They're actually looking to expand into more area. While it's doing that in Israel, within the cabinet and the people, there's jostling and confusion and chaos to some extent. But as but because there's a strong leadership, it's sort of like pulling it towards a, a time frame somewhere. But to gel all the ten, twelve tribes together, it will take that miracle war. There's a scripture. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 14, it talks about the two sticks in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, how that God was going to put them together. It's not being put together by men, but God will cause circumstances for them to come together. Yes, they came into the land in 1948, but by the time you reach to 1967, in that one verse of Isaiah 11, verse 14, you have two events in it. Just like when you read in Malachi, the Lord shall send the spirit of Elijah before the great and terrible days in that one sentence, but it's two events. So is it in two events in Isaiah 11 and 14. It says, Judah and Ephraim will go to the west side and conquer that land. That is history, 1967. But Judah and Ephraim has not gone to the east side to take the east side to the other side of the Jordan. That's where that miracle war will do that. Then Israel will be complete in her land. All right? So we are getting near to the point God's allowing pressures as the world gets against Israel, somewhere God will cause her to act and to move in a miraculous war. That's the vision that God gave to the apostles, how it was to unfold. Now, without going into a whole lot of scriptures, if you have access to the chart, you can find them. But that miracle war, these are all the scriptures that pertains to that miracle war where Israel would now get all her land. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Israel has already her land then. These are the scriptures. And you, you can go, if you need to know the history and if you haven't seen it, it would be good to read to you the countdown. It all explains 
what has happened during that period of time. Now, that's the miracle war. But the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, God's going to get the Gentiles to put down Russia. Because those Arab nations, along with Russia, is going to try to destroy Israel. But God's going to intervene himself. Whatever army they send to that land, and if Putin is listening, if he's the man at that hour, you're going to know there's a God in heaven. Whatever comes against Israel, God's going to not use missiles or, or laser beams or nuclear weapons. Like it says in Job, God said, I reserve hail for this time of, time of war. And he's not talking about a little hail, but a side of a quarter. About 50 to 100 pounds. No aircraft can survive it. No thing that you put on ground is going to go anywhere. And that's why it says in, in, the, in the Battle of Ezekiel 38, 39, it'll take seven months to bury the dead and seven years to clean the weapon. So it's not going to be a little show that the body of the beast is trying to get at Israel. But what does this do? Now it shakes the whole world because to the world that don't know the scripture, we come to the brink of nuclear war, Armageddon. Now they're scared to death. So now the body of the beast that's been, God has been trying to prepare over time, they too will not want war. They'll be only too glad to sign with the Antichrist. And then you'll have the wig of Daniel right there ready to start. And the bride will be right there in her position in that, in that seventh seal time factor. All right. So we're looking at the time. Right over here. We're in this third watch. What's been happening in those last three watches? Prior to 1963, or if you want to, in that period, I'm using, have to use a reference somewhere. By the time you arrived in 1963, the denominational world has all been dealt with. They are bun the tears are being bundled together. That's an ongoing thing, but the majority got start the major bundling had already been in progress. But the bride now. God is not focusing in the world religions no more. Now he's focusing on his bride. And that's why you find in Matthew chapter twenty five, when the Lord come, those that were ready went in with him. They were ready to receive what he would be doing. But now, as he's going in to bring the bride into place, that's where the scripture of Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 comes into play. He's going to remove everything, not out of the world, not out of the denominational world, but out of the kingdom of God, everything that offends and commits iniquity. And in the kingdom of God, that's why the other scripture that we find in Luke chapter 19 verse 14 that his citizens hated him they were among where the kingdom of God is at that's where the tares will be among the bride people from 63 onwards as we're looking at these three watches going through and the and it is God that knows who is and who isn't we're not here to point to you and I who is and who isn't but there are scriptures that has more or less come to the forefront that I can see now. When it talks about in Luke chapter 12, that the Lord has come. He want, See, when the Lord came, right here, as we've gone into the room, Luke chapter 12, verse 36, 37, 38 comes into play. 
He says, when he comes, he makes them sit down to meet. And that meat would be all through. He's feeding that meat where? Where the kingdom of God is at. Where the believers are assembled at. And where the tares or the intellectual believers are there also. And God knows this. And it's not up to every pastor in assembly to find out, well, uh, maybe that might be a tear here. No, God's going to allow things to go on where he's going to do the separation. And by the history that we can look at from 63 coming on through, as each move has grew up, the tares grew up with the believer alongside God allows them to stay there till the next chain comes along when they have now to walk and to have to stand up f- forward. That's where it identifies them. And what looks to us as chaos and it shouldn't be and what's going wrong, it is God's doing allowing this separation to take place. Because if he didn't allow them, then what is really in the hearts of the terrorists, you would never know. They would still be sitting among us. Now, I'm not here to identify who's a tear, please. But just to explain, to see what's been going on in this in these period of time. So, from 63, that's where in the kingdom God, now in where the body of Christ is, is where he's starting to separate the sheep from the goat. And then Luke talks about when he does speak, no, sorry, yeah in, yeah, in Luke chapter 12, I believe it's, well, here, 36, yeah. And, and this word seems to be have come to more to the forefront than before. He says, when he will return from the wedding, and when he cometh and knocketh, that he may open up to him immediately. Why the rush? And he's going to be feeding meat, not just one time in 63, but in every one of these watches. He's saying the carcass, when it comes, that fresh meat, we're open, the true eagle will be opening up to him immediately. The intellectual don't. Well, I've got to look at it. What do you think, brother? Do you think it's, it's okay? It sounds right. I could be just somebody's idea. Is that how you received truth when you first came to the Lord? When he brought you to salvation, you said, well, I've got to look at this. Something drew you and immediately you went. Oh, but that's just a simple... Re- Every revelation is the same. When the Spirit of God strikes you, when the Comforter comes and says, this is me, immediately, it hits you, strikes you. Well, oh, but I want to be in a perfect church. Lord, you're not doing it right. There there needs to be a perfect church somewhere. He knows what he's doing. And it would take those three periods of time to remove things that offend. And what are things that offend? Is it because somebody's maybe drinking too much wine? It's not talking about that area. And commits iniquity. He's talking about those that says, now there'd be two types. Some go wild into wild revelation. And that's what brings the chaos. But in time, the true believers can see through it, and whatever is brought falls to the ground. While the truth, it keeps marching on. That's the hour you and I are living in, whether you you don't have to believe me, just wait how this is going to play out. Commit iniquity and offenses. Offenses is speaking against the word that the Lord is bringing down on ground. 
He's not, he wasn't doing that in the days of he's dealing with the denominations. He's dealing that when that bride started going into that room to be taught, educated in the plan of God to be ready and to make me ready. Now, when we go to Luke chapter 13, and I know I'm repeating some things, but I just want to bring things a little, a little bit more information on, on what's transpiring. In Luke, the 13th chapter, verse 24, Jesus says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Oh, that's only those in the early church. Those are only those in the denominational world. It applies to the tares in this hour. It's the same scripture, the same conditions. And watch what he says. When he's saying that, he's, he's not really speaking in the terms of when it was in the beginning of the grace age. He says, when and once the master of the house is risen up. When is he rising up? Huh? Has the master risen up here this morning? It's a good question. The master has not risen up yet. Jesus is still sitting on that throne of mercy. He's sitting positional wise. But when he's finished with being a high priest, and I know some there's contention about that, the next thing too. What, is, what becomes of him after he's being high priest? He becomes judge. Yeah, okay. That, that'll do. So during the grace age, he's been high priest all along. And as you see in Revelation chapter 1, where it says Jesus is among the, the candlestick, it's portraying you a finished picture. And in the finished picture, Jesus is not dressed as a high priest. He's dressed as a judge. So that tells me when he's finished his high priest function, he's there as judge. And we should clue in. If he's going to be judge, he can't be everywhere present uh, for everything. That's why he sends an angel down when that seal is broken. Because what makes it change from being a high priest to being a judge is when he breaks that seventh seal. Now in that time factor of the seventh seal, he is judge. He will judge all the deceased bride saints in heaven for their reward. While the angel down here does it here. And that's why when the Lord opened up concerning 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 verse 1, he's going to judge the quick and the dead. And none has had an answer yet how to put that together. The dead is the dead in Christ he's talking about. The quick means somebody living on the earth, not living in heaven. So that's the only way when he becomes judge. He's the one that oversees the whole thing. So now he's risen up from being a high priest and now he becomes judge. While well, leading up to that time of him being judge, watch what takes place. And once the master of the house is risen up and shut the door, what door is shut? The Jewish door? Maybe the door in this building? 
No. It's the door to Revelation. This door that's being shut in Luke chapter 13, verse 25, is not your doors that's shut. If I can find the right, right place. Okay, well, I can do this. The door was shut to the foolish virgins way back here when the bride started going into a message. The door to the foolish virgin was shut at that period of time. Now, when I say 1963, it's a reference point. Don't take, go to task saying, well, he said 1963, and I can prove it's 1957 or whatever. Go play with it if you want to play. But the whole point, you're, miss, you're missing the point. He closing the door to the foolish virgins. And they won't come to the bride till the time that he rises up. And when he rises up, other groups are going to be involved to be asking questions. Now here it says, And he has shut the door, and you begin to stand without and knock at the door. Now the reason the door revelation is finished, because when that seventh seal is broke, it's finished as far as revelatory for God's word is concerned of his plan of salvation. Yes, the seven thunders are going to utter things, but it's not concerning the plan of salvation. It's concerning getting the bride ready, which is going to be taking place in that small period of time. It's not even written what it is. And it's not for, if you want to, the, the tares or the denomination or any other kind of believers. And he says, I know you not from whence you are. Then you shall begin to have eaten and drunken in thy presence. Where was that presence? Where the kingdom of God was, where the bride was receiving her meat, her revelation, her truth. It was in that area, in those streets, where the presence of God was. But now that door is shut. Then he shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence. And that's taught in our streets. But look what he tells them. But he says, But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from whence you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. When we're talking about the foolish virgins, when you go to Matthew chapter 25, he never calls the foolish virgins, you are workers of iniquity. Only to the tares that he tells you, here in Luke chapter 13, it is to them they are workers of iniquity. Because their door being shut, their door being shut is over here. There, yeah, right here. So when he rises up, it's when everybody's going to come into play. Now what what brings this about? What's going to cause people to ask, Lord, open up to us? What's going to ask the denominational tares to say, Lord, open up to us now? We want to know what's going on. They're not asking now. If anything, they're going the wrong, the opposite way. They're going to Mama, Rome. Those that was in Brother Branham that had just stayed there. Are they looking and saying, Lord, open up to us now. No, they're carrying on as if they did just the same they did after the passing of Brother Branham. And the different separate group and the chaos is still there. Even in Brother Jackson's move, you have the splinters also in this move as well. It is no different from any move of God, whether you talk Luther, Wesley, uh, the moving of the oil message, the uh, Brother Branham, Brother Jackson, and even in this hour. Well, I didn't know that. I thought we were all coming together. Well, how do you think it's God's going to do it? 
So as we are moving towards that period of time, are the fact of fractions that has went in different directions. Now we look at only those we know in North America, but there's some in the in Europe, there's some in the Philippines, in that in the in those countries there as well. That has taken the apostle message and gone in different directions with it, even in Norway. Now it's not identifying in that matter. I'm just trying to say they are they splinter. They're not all speaking the same thing. Oh, when he talks about Jesus died for you and the oneness and, and the revela- certain revelation, yeah, the, that's going back to some basics that should have been established before 1963, if you've been living prior to that hour. But we're living now here, and so are they looking, say, open unto us now? No, they're not. They just dug their feet and and settled themselves in, and nothing will budge them. First of all, you could, even if you could go talk to them, they wouldn't want to hear you anyway, because they believe they're right. Just like every separated group believes they're right. Well, all this mess can't be all right. So, what's it going to take? There's a scripture. It's found in Joel, chapter 3. Uh, maybe around verse 14. Let me, well, I've got to hear somewhere. Yeah, 3, verse 14. Now that verse is in the middle of other verses as well. But we have to know how to read and discern, rightfully divide the Word of God. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near. It didn't say it was there. So it's somewhere prior to the Lord actually coming in His physical second coming. There's going to be multitudes. And it's stressing the point, it says it twice. Multitudes, multitudes will be there in the valley of decision. And all the decisions is not religious. What's going to bring this about to bring the people to their knees to have a really a second look? So to fulfill the scripture we're talking about concerning the religious element, Lord, open unto us. When the air of the miraculous, when the miracle war takes place, wake up call number one. The building of the temple. The Ezekiel war. The denomination world thinks it's Armageddon. It's not even there. So now their beliefs are being shattered because something's on ground. They can't deny. It's not coming from a preacher. Events is on ground has now shown Hey, we got something wrong. And if, and if pride is not in there and they'll admit I've, I was wrong on something or I need to know more, this is going to cause them to say, Lord, open unto us. So that's going to be a process of time here. At the same time, in that miracle war, when Israel gets all her land, as far as the kingdoms of the world, the nations... It's going to shake them. Well, maybe God is with them because they got their land in a very short time in a miraculous manner. God was on the scene and it'll be in display. But then the war of Ezekiel 38, 39 brings them to their knees, the political side. Now they're in a decision. They know God brought Israel in her land. What are we going to do with her? Now you have arrived to the week of Daniel and the Antichrist comes on the scene. I got a solution for you. Let's all come together. Let's all work together. And so the nations will have to, if I know there's the leaders of our nations, different nations are not religious, but they'll have to either 
acknowledge that God put Israel in her land and God deals with her, or we're going to compromise and see what the Pope says in order to get everything and it may work with Israel at the same time. No. So they're in a, so the political countries, they're in a valley of decisions as well. And God's looking at it. And the reason they're in the valley of decision because they didn't know, didn't want to know, and don't care to know whether it is the tares, the denominations, or the countries when that hour comes. But now they're shaken. This is coming up. Well, do you know when, Brother? No, I don't know when. But I know it's not that far down the road. Because we're in that third watch. That I do know. And then the tares that separate themselves, whether it's whatever camp you're in, whether, whether it is from the oil message, whether it is from the denominational from Trinity to Oneness, whether it's from Brother Brown's move, even from Brother Jackson's move, you get things they love to use. Oh, here. You'll hear them go on their pulpit. And you'll hear this probably from days going forward from now. They went out from us, but they are not of us. The oneness in the Trinitarian use that. Did that prove that? Does that make that right? The Branham camp used the same type of scriptures. There are raging wolves. There are, there are antichrists. They, they, they were not of us. Just to make people cow down on trying to whip the people, they wrong, we're right. We've seen it after Brother Jackson's passing away. That ministry of state there really hammered hard in those earlier years. They went out from us and they're not of us. So we are true believers, they are Antichrist. Does it make it so? Actually, a preacher that preaches those things actually identifies what he is. Because if anything's going to bring the bride together, he's not saying, well, they're Antichrist and we're not, and, and they, they are raging wolves, and then there's, they're, they're, they're not sparing the flock, and all these scriptures that you want to use. Whether it's in Romans chapter 16, 2 Peter, Matthew chapter 7, verse 10, Acts 20, all these scriptures, just to, and it, it is true that that exists but to use it to club the people to keep them in submit, submission and to, to appoint it that it's the others they're going down the wrong road what will bring people together when God has a servant that brings forth fresh food that will join and bring a people together more so than saying well, they're raging wolves. Is the church in Indiana, because they use those scriptures, make them the bride? Not one bit. They hold on to that revelation the third day. Hell. Uh, the uh, lake of fire is in the center of the earth. Baby's going to be born in the millennium. As a matter of fact, maybe some of you haven't seen it, but these are all the different revelations that's come out since Brother Jackson. And I heard a good one yesterday, too. Depending on what you hear, you're only familiar with what's taking place. Now, from the Philippines, there's a brother saying that the fivefold ministry is the voice of the archangel. That's as wrong as wrong could be. That archangel's not coming. It's not going to be here till Jesus is finished with the mercy seat. So that throws that out of the window. But they're preaching that in those areas. 
There may be others that grabbed onto that as well. I'm here to tell you that's a false revelation. It may sound good. Preachers, intellectual preachers can put things together that make sounds good. But in time, truth is going to come along and says, going to, the bride, the true bride will see it. That is wrong. Because this scripture says, that can't be. Well, so what time are you living in right now? When the Lord is separating everything that offends and commits iniquity in his kingdom. How's he doing it? By testing each move, by removing that servant and allowing chaos to take place. Because if chaos was not allowed, if God had a servant that would move like from Moses to, uh, to Joshua going into the promised land, that would have been immediately and held things in check. Then those that are not, of, uh, that are not true believers would not be able to express himself. But in the chaos... Nobody's duty bound by anybody once God moves a servant off the scene. Each one comes up to the platform. I know what the Word of God is. And he goes in his own little revelation or his own idea how God should be doing things. Well, for me, I know that in the chaos, God's allowing this to, he's, to see who's going to believe what and see, see what people are doing, and whether they can see the pattern that's in the Scripture, how God brings unity or brings this bride along. And if you don't see it, then help yourself to what you want to play with. See, you don't care, brother. I don't care to be in this chaos. Let God raise who He wants there needs to be something to bring this together. And nothing, a man even now, if he would speak loud enough, is going to shake them because they're so prideful in where they think they believe and think they know what the truth is. It's going to take that air of the miraculous. And then when God starts to move with those spiritual gifts and anoint the ministry of that hour, that's going to cut everything else off and the bride will come to her completion. She'll be working towards perfection. That'll be at the same time that miraculous war will be taking place. Well, Brother Fred, will it take place in day one when the miraculous war takes place? No, it's about the same period of time. Do you still love the Lord? Yes. What is the Lord more concerned about in this hour? Is the Lord looking down on the world and saying, well, I want you to be a prepared Christian, but never mind about my plan about the future things. Uh, that's optional. It is not optional. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, watch when I'm coming. And he's saying, watch when I'm coming. He's not talking about all that was done under the ministry of Jesus or the ministry of the apostles in the early church. But God, why would, send, why would he send meat in this hour anyway to begin with? It's the feet of people. We are a people that's going to represent the bride to its sevenfold light. Now there's something else. Some just can't see that either. In... When Jesus in the sowing scene, you find in Matthew 24, 5, 14, those talents starts from the day from the early church. That's where, they're, because Jesus is using the word talents specifically. A man is giving certain talents. He's to increase. Increase. But it's on a one-to-one -one ratio. As you read that parable, it says, be, 
man is, he's, he shows Jesus going away, and he delivers the talents to them at the beginning. But when you pick up the parable in Luke chapter 19, he's not starting from 33 A.D. He's starting when, in the time frame of these last 100 years, that there would be five, that there would be ten servants, which five wise, five foolish, in that period of time identifies here the end time. Now the things that men is to increase in this hour, Jesus purposely didn't tell, didn't put in, well, they are talents to show the distinction between the early church, he called that talents. But it is the revelation of the Holy Ghost what it is. And here at the end time, he calls it pounds. So there's no talents or things that come out of heaven that's given to them in the, sense, in the physical sense. And there's no physical pounds that you see, a pound of butter. Or, well, not butter, but whatever. I've got to use something. That's coming physically here at the end time. Both is revelation, but one's to identify the early church. One is to identify the end church here. And in that hour, the early church of the talent, because reflected in the increase that those that did have, they increased one to one. But here at the end time, it would increase sevenfold. Why do you say sevenfold? Well, look at how they increase. One was given ten, he increased, increased, uh, well, sorry, gave one, he increased ten. One was given five, he, uh, one, he would increase five. The average is seven to one. That goes along with what Isaiah said in that, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26. The light of the moon will be like one day. Where will that happen? It's looking at its final conclusion, looking backwards. The Lord's looking at it from the day of the Lord. By the time the day of the Lord comes, Israel will have gone from types and shadow into the revelation of Jesus Christ. They went from a, a, a shadow, which is the moon, into sunlight. One day. That's what it's referring to. Then it talks about the light of one day will all become a sevenfold light. Now, with the revelation that was there in, that, in the early church would be sevenfold in the end time. Not sevenfold of the Holy Ghost but seven times more understanding of the revelatory plan of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So don't think, well, oh, why? we got seven fold, we got more with the early church. As far as the Holy Ghost, they had, seems like they had a better quality way they were walking than we Gentiles here at the end. Yes, we have more knowledge, but God knows this. And the seven fold light, now I had my eyes, cataracts done, it's not sevenfold sunlight. If you had sevenfold sunlight, plant life would cease to exist. You'd go blind if you didn't have welder's glasses. And the sevenfold light that the bride carries, she's not lighting up the world in the sense of physical light, but it's revelatory light. And when she goes to heaven, her sevenfold light doesn't make the heavenly realm seven times brighter. Because remember, the one that lights the heavenly realm is none other but God himself. He is light as well as truth. He lights up the spirit world. And God does not grow fatter or more light as time would go on. He never changes. So the light that he uses to light the spirit world will always remain the same. But in that spirit world, the bride will have sevenfold light of the plan of God. And we can go looking at the millennium in the New Jerusalem, but, oh my goodness. It's 20 to 1. Yes, God has allowed chaos. And the only way this chaos is going to be remedied. It's God's doing. We have to accept and re recognize that. But the Holy Ghost believer, when he hears truth, when he has a piece of that carcass, he opens up to him immediately. Tears don't. They fuss. Innuendos. Can't be. We don't think. He's trying to make something of himself. Uh, 
Isn't that what they said about Brother Branham at the end when he's preaching the word? Isn't that what they said about Brother Jackson as well? What do you think to make different, anything different in this hour? It just identifies where they are. I know. In what you're seeing this morning, it's wonderful knowing the plan of God. But let us not neglect how we walk as well. Because having all that knowledge without the inner man being prepared, he ain't going to fare out any better than those that has the inner man prepared without having the knowledge of the hour of this at time. And that's why there would be three watches. The bride will be totally prepared when that time comes. She'll be walking in truth. If fresh meat, if revelation was not important, why have the book of Revelation? Let's tear out some chapters in the, in the Old Testament. We don't need that. We just need to be saved walking with the Lord. That's what the denominational world are preaching. That's how they're coming together in love. That's how they're showing that unity. That will never, it'll bring a unity, but not a God move of unity. Well, Lord bless. Let's just stand at this time, have the musicians to come. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you have opened us to us in, in this hour. And as we would look at the things that you have revealed to us, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Not that we have to, to come to such a place that we have swell heads, but it's because of what you have brought. It's you leading, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you will have a bride that will come to her completion. I thank you, Lord, now in that name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Have you been to come? You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Are you still happy? Where, Chief G. Where would I be without Jesus? cheer he knows what he's doing we may not like the confusion but rest that he is the author allowing this to take place because when it all ends we'll all be believing alike 
and you talk about Holy Ghost meetings, I'm looking for those nine spiritual gifts to take place. How about you? Amen. I mean, it's fine to listen to a preacher for a while, but I love that moving of that spirit. Oh, how what I would love to maybe have been during the 50s when God was moving hand and fist over, doing miraculous things. Not that he's not doing things today. Because if that was going on, while this is going on, people would just go to the gifts. But it's coming. And it's not going to be the preacher. It's going to be the only one doing it, having those nine gifts. We all have a responsibility. It's up to each individual, every child of God, to seek for those gifts and to operate them as the Lord has instructed us to use it. Not how we want to use it. Well, all right. I'm happy. I'm hungry now. So praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Brother Ray, if you would come and dismiss us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful time. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We just pray once again that you would dismiss us with your blessing. Give us traveling mercies. Be with your children throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.